Okay, we're going to look at some examples of some dual maps, um, starting with polynomials and, and sequences. So let's consider uh, the good old derivative operator. So this is a linear transform uh, or linear operator on the polynomials uh, given by dp is p prime. And then we'll look at so let's consider some functional um, phi in PR prime. And, and so notice that these are different, right? So this is a derivative. This is a dual. So those are different primes. So unfortunately, that notation is used in a couple of different ways. OK, so let's look exa at examples of functionals. So if we had, uh, so phi of p, one of the ones we looked at before was, let's integrate p from 0 to 1, right? So then uh, d prime applied to phi. So what does the dual map do to this functional? Well, we'll understand that if we see what it does to a polynomial. So let's apply it to some polynomial p. And then remember that d prime is defined as precomposition. So this is going to be phi of d applied to p, right? And then d operates by differentiating. So this is phi of p prime. Uh, and then phi works by integrating its argument. So this is now the integral from 0 to 1 of p prime dx, which by fundamental theorem of calculus is p1 minus p0. OK, let's look at a couple more examples, and we'll see a bit of a trend. So if we take phi uh, to be an evaluation functional, so like let's say evaluation at 3, um, then d prime of phi applied to p once again. This is going to be phi of uh, dp, which is phi of p prime. And in this case, phi works by evaluating its argument at 3. So this is going to be p prime of 3. OK. So if we carry on, let's look at another one. We had, um, uh, actually, you know what? Let me back up. I'm, I'm going to supply like a little summary of, of what we have here. So what we see for the, the first one is uh, that d prime of phi takes uh, p to p1 minus p0. So d prime took some integration functional to an evaluation functional. And then in the second one, what did we see? We saw that um, d prime of phi is something that takes um, p to p prime of 3, which means that uh, d prime took evaluation to evaluate a derivative. And so let's carry on now. And let's look at one where it's evaluated derivative. So for phi prime given by p prime of 1, uh, we have d prime of phi applied to the, a polynomial is going to be now um, phi of d applied to p, which is um, phi of p prime. And then p prime, sorry, phi differentiates its argument and then evaluates it at 1. So this is going to be the second derivative evaluated at 1. And so d prime takes uh, p to p double prime at 1 
which means that D prime is mapping the evaluation of a derivative to evaluation of a second derivative. Okay, and so you can see the way that trend is, is going. Um, let's look at some sequences. So suppose we take um, uh, the backward shift So this is a linear map from uh, f infinity to f infinity, and it works by t minus of x1, x2, etc. is x2, x3, etc. So it just eats the first argument. Everybody gets uh, bumped or shifted one down. Okay. Um, and we'll look at uh, t plus, the forward shift. Oops. And that one works by inserting a zero at the beginning and bumping everything down. Okay, so let's see. If, um, if we consider an uh, evaluation functional, so like if phi of x just extracts the first coordinate of x, then what do we see? Well, then... Uh, T minus prime uh, applied to phi. What's it going to do? Well, let's apply it to x. Look at all these parentheses. It's getting to be a gory mess of parentheses. Um, now the prime, the T prime works by precomposition. So now we're looking at phi of T negative of x. And so we look to see how the, the backward shift operates. And so this is going to be phi of, and then the backward shift would mean that we have um, x2, x3 as its argument. And phi extracts the first argument of the thing that it has, or the first coordinate of its argument, rather, uh, which would be x2. Um, if we looked at uh, what happens with t plus prime, What do we have there? Um, so this is going to be phi of t plus x, which is phi of uh, something beginning with 0. And since phi pulls off its first coordinate, we just get 0. But let's take a little bit of a closer look. So this, this one was for, let's just, uh, with evaluating sort of, or extracting the, the first coordinate. Let's take phi k to be um, the kth coordinate extractor. Okay, so then if we look at these guys, t minus prime applied to phi, applied to x, is then going to give us well, let's see what happens now. So now we have uh, phi of t minus x, and t minus shifts everybody to the left. So now phi is going to extract the kth coordinate of the shifted thing, which is the kth plus one coordinate of the original thing, right? So. That's, that's what happens, you can see, um, uh, right here in, in this example, right? So <clears throat> we took the thing, so instead of getting x1 out of x, we ended up getting x2, something that was one to the right. And similarly, if we look at t plus prime phi, Now what do we do? Well, now we uh, stick a zero in at the beginning and bump everybody to the right. So the coordinate that we end up pulling out is going to be um, the one to the left of where we normally would have gotten it. Unless we happen to get zero because k is right back at the very beginning and we're pulling that zeroth one out like we did in the first step. So this would be if uh, k is equal to, whoops, one, and this is for k greater than one. Okay, and so um, 
a, a useful observation to make here is that t prime uh, moves as a shift moves things in the opposite direction <coughs> um, as t and, and notice that it is not the inverse and, and the reason why it's not the inverse here remember that that t prime operates on uh, v prime t operates on v and if we look at it as an operator what do we see well we actually see that um, t plus prime what did it do it took um, phi k and sends it to um, phi k plus 1 the evaluation at k plus 1 and t minus prime oh I'm sorry I, I the first one was t minus prime this is t plus prime t plus prime applied to phi k gives you the evaluation at 1 to the left so it goes to minus so here's another example of what I referred to as the old switcheroo or contravariance And then for the last example that I want to do, um, if we have a subspace U of vector space V, we can define a, a map from U, a linear transform from U into V by inclusion. So I've got the little subset inclusion symbol over there. And this means that um, i of u just gets sent to u. And the only uh, thing to keep in mind here is that in the first part right here, this is uh, u as an element of u, or in the second one, this is u as an element of v. So it's not the identity map because the domain and codomain are not the same. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so, so we're just embedding things into where they ought to be, more or less. Okay. So then um, it turns out that uh, if we look at I prime as a map from V prime to U prime, right? We're going the opposite direction because it's the dual map. Uh, and we want to identify what this thing is. It's a restriction. And, and so let me explain what I mean by that. I mean that... Um, for phi uh, in v prime, i prime phi, and now we have to think, okay, so what is this going to be um, applied to? So this is going to be, uh, well, it's going to be applied to v, but let's see what it does for elements which are in u, which is a subset of v. Okay, so then this is going to be uh, phi of i of u, which is phi of u by the definition of i as inclusion. Um, oh, and that's that's all I want to say. So, what do we have here? So this this again this this is where u is thought of as an element of v, and in this one here, this is u thought of as an element of u. Okay. <coughs> So conclusion, I prime phi of u equals phi of u as long as we're in the smaller space, the subspace. Um, but we saw that you can always extend a function on the smaller space to something which is uh, linear by requiring it to be zero outside its original domain of definition. So since any element of u prime can be 
extended uh, by zero, um, <clears throat> to a new element on the larger space V prime. And so this was actually an exercise back in uh, 3A, that was exercise 11. Um, <clears throat> And, and so what that means is we define phi of v to be equal to, sorry, psi of v to be equal to phi of v if v happened to be back in u and zero if not. So now we have a function uh, where um, by construction phi equals psi on u and that's what i mean by saying it's a, it's an extension um, and so um since we can always extend a function like this we know that um i prime is surjective right because uh given any phi I can construct a, a psi like this that uh, maps to it. Uh, oh, sorry, I wrote that the wrong way. This is. Uh, no, 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 no. I did. I wrote that the right way. There we go. Boom. Okay. So given phi, you extend it to psi like this, and then you found a thing that's in the pre-image of phi under i prime. Okay, there we go. Um, and this is gonna be useful in the next clip. So let's see a picture of this. So suppose I have u, and so here's my, here's my u in some terrible artistic rendition of it. And now I'm going to um, embed it into uh, v, so we've got here's here's v right, and so here's here's the embedding map or the inclusion map i that just sticks um, each point where it's supposed to be right in the image, uh, <clears throat> and then we've got some function uh, phi here. Um, and, oh, actually, let me see. By my labeling, I guess I want to call that one psi. Sorry. And then we pull it back. And so this is... That's my uh, uh, I prime. Okay, and then, so, yeah, so just going back to what we were writing earlier, what do we have? So our, our inclusion right here um, has as its dual taking functions from all of V to F and restricting them to functions that are just from U to F, 